Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome this evening's guest speaker. Uh, Robert Beard is a professional geologist here in the state of Pennsylvania. He's licensed by the state and he works for a consulting firm in the Mechanicsburg area. He got his uh, initial degree from Cal State uh, in geology and his MS from the uh, University of New Mexico. Um, he came to Pennsylvania in the 80s uh, from, you know, basically out west, I think, as he puts it, uh, due to a collapse in the uh, oil and mineral industries. Um, he worked in Pennsylvania for a while and then also branched out to do work in the 90s down in the Caribbean. Uh, he is the author of at least five books, I believe, that you can see up on the table, and they all have to do with rock hounding in various states. So you'll find one up there that relates to rock hounding in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So these are kind of a places that you can go that I'm guessing are still available. We don't have to worry about lawsuits or anybody chasing you. Yeah, yeah, as long as you're not, uh, you know, just always be aware of, you know, the sure. land status changes all the time. Sure. But at any rate, the books that he has uh, available are for sale, so you can see uh, him afterwards if you'd like any of the particular copies. I'm sure he'll be delighted to sign for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Robert and let him get going okay. with the program. Great. All right. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Peter. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah. Get the get the lights too there. Yeah, I will. Okay. Well, anyway, hey, thanks a lot for everyone for coming tonight. Uh, I know. Uh, what I'm talking about tonight is. Uh, something that I just went through with, uh, I'm doing a revision to Rock County in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and so I had a lot, of, a lot of experience now with finding new and long lost mineral fossil localities, places that I've been trying to find, and also want to find some new ones too. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so just like uh, in every field season, you know, you know always want to need, want and find and need to find new sites. And, this can be kind of tricky. But in my case, I always have to use, I always have to find new sites for my rock counting books and articles. I write a lot for Rock and Jeff magazines too. So, um, but I've always got, you know, I've got deadlines, so I've got to find sites quickly. And we can't get those lights in the back there too. He's back here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a, does that help you? Yeah, that was kind of shiny in my, I, uh, which one do we get on? I'd actually prefer it to a much darker one. All right. Okay. Is that? Well, that's fine. If, that, if that's all right. Yeah. But uh, at any rate, very few times do I find sites that aren't reported elsewhere. There's usually someone that knows something about about sites. And. What I've been doing though is uh, applying these techniques that I've been uh, using in Pennsylvania and surrounding states. I apply that nationwide and internationally whenever, whenever I'm traveling. Okay, and my main collecting areas are Pennsylvania and New Mexico. I'm actually from, I've moved here from New Mexico. All right, well, one thing I want to talk about though is uh, the curse of knowledge. And this is basically, it, kind of a complicated way to say it, but it's a cognitive bias that occurs when an individual who is communicating with others assumes that others have the same level of knowledge as, as, as himself. And part of the thing I'm sometimes faced with is that a lot of these techniques may seem obvious to, to me and probably to many of you too, but to others that haven't done, haven't really been in this hobby that long, sometimes we can't assume that everyone else has the same level of knowledge. And, and after 40 years, it becomes very easy to take things that you know for granted and assume that others know them, but that's almost always not the case. I assume you can read those cartoons, so I'm not going to read those. All right. All right. But there are some th things that I do when I consider when I'm evaluating new sites. And the first thing I look at is, is it accessible? And Next thing is, what types of rocks, minerals, or fossils are there? Now, I'm fortunate being a geologist. I've generally got a pretty good idea of what, what the geologic environment is where I'm going to be looking at, what, looking at when I'm looking at rocks. But also, what type of site is it? Is it, is it a road cut, an outcrop, a quarry, a mine? Um, and then, is it privately owned or owned by the government? That's, that's really, really important as well. 
And if it's a road cut, is it in the road right away? You know, we see lots of great road cuts, but they're like sometimes sheer faces that are you know right next to the road. You can't collect there safely at all. And and again, what's most important is collecting allowed. Now, and also, is it safe to visit? A lot of these, especially road cuts, you've got to be really careful because generally, I found that you can collect there, and you're not going to get bothered by the police as long as you're not impeding traffic or. Uh, but there are a lot of road cuts that you know are posted against trespassing and posted against rock climbing too. All right, so where, where do you start? Okay, well, back when I started doing this about 40 years ago, you know, finding mineral and fossil localities today is much different than it was 40 years ago. We've got a lot of land status changes. Uh, accessibility is a big change. More land is private but the roads are better, so there's kind of a trade-off there. And, but we've also got a lot more access to information, and this is really important. And so now, pretty much all the geologic reports, the land status, maps, and everything, it's almost all online now, which is great, because now you can access that, you know, anytime, anytime of day or night, just with a couple clicks, okay? Now, I'm going to go back to when I just got started in this. This is back in 1982. I was just starting Rock, Rock County. And I was a geology student at Cal State of Chico. And, and during the summer of 82, I worked with the U.S. Bureau of Mines in Northern California. And we were doing this project that was called uh, part of the Rare 2 program, where we were identifying mineral resources in proposed wilderness areas. And so consequently, I got to see a whole lot of, whole lot of mines. but yeah, you know, we had to quickly identify resources with very limited time. We just had one field season, and shortly after that, the government got rid of the Bureau of Mines anyway. So, but uh, but I know one thing: they, I, this was where I first started really actively collecting rocks, and a lot of the a lot of the senior managers there thought that was pretty funny. They thought said I'd get over that, but I never never really did. Okay. So back in 1982, we had a lot of great geologic maps to work with, but we really didn't have much else. Um, and our work was in what was known as the Chips Creek Wilderness Area in Northern California. I don't know, anyone here from Northern California at all? But this is like north, oh, quite a ways uh, north of Sacramento. Um, and this is in the Feather River Canyon. But we looked at, uh, Topographic maps, mainly the 7.5 minute and larger scale maps. And we also looked at uh, blueprint geologic maps. We got these from the geologic survey. They were not in print, but they were actually materials that the survey provided to us. And we actually, at night, you know, we would use you know, colored pencils and lighter fluid to color, color the maps. And uh, that, uh, you know, we really didn't have a uh, didn't have much else to do other than color maps at night. And we'd uh, look at the, the topographic maps for mine symbols. This was really important. You know, that's a, like a typical topo map symbol for a mine. This was a, a, a shaft. You know, this was a, a tunnel, which we also called an adit. And of course, the X's were all prospects. <coughs> all right. Well, a couple. Summers afterwards, I then worked with the Superior Oils Mineral Group. Uh, this was in southwest New Mexico. And here I was uh, working as an exploration geologist. And we were looking for bulk tonnage gold deposits in southwest New Mexico. These are basically these very large scale disseminated deposits of gold, typically in a limestone with a, with a volcanic, uh, volcanic fluid source. And well, we had to identify quickly where to go to look look for gold. And again, we focused on existing mining districts, not, there are a lot of really vast barren areas of volcanic fields out there too, but we stayed away from that. We really looked at more of the existing districts. And so back then, of course, we still had a lot of the same tools. We had really, really great geologic maps. But again, and this was the area that we were looking at. This is a you can kind of see this is the boot heel of New Mexico. This is uh, all these rocks up here. That's the Mobile Dado field, um, Mobile Dado volcanic field. 
Yeah, but there's a uh, you know lots and lots of mines around here that we were looking at. Uh, again, yeah, we look at the topo maps for for the old mines, and we look at geologic maps and reports. And I also had access to. I, I knew the guy that managed the files at the New Mexico Bureau of Mines, and he was really really great about getting me access to a lot of these. And my boss really liked seeing all the files I could get. Nowadays, of course, all that stuff's online, so it's a lot tougher to impress someone like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we, out west, it's much different than out east. We have a lot of areas of Bureau of Land Management land and National Forest land that you can actually do exploration on. And but we stayed away from the big land grants. These were grants that they gave to uh, oh, some of the old land holders there. It was, they, they were often called Spanish land grants. Uh, a lot of active mining claims, you know, we would stay away from those. Uh, Indian reservations were off limits, but those were pretty clearly marked. Uh, national parks, you're not going to be able to make a mine in a national park. And any other similar land. Um, found a lot of private ranch land. Uh, ranchers were not very friendly to us on a lot of these places. And, but the one thing my boss <coughs> mentioned, which I thought was interesting, was that the old prospectors didn't miss much. You know, you'd see these you know, prospect pits out in the middle of nowhere, and you know, if you went and looked at them, you'd generally find some mineralization in them. Now, what I want to say about 7.5 and a topo maps, these are a really, really useful tool. Uh, this has always been one of my best ways to find new sites. Um, but nowadays, <clears throat> the government to save money, and this was after uh, after 2001, they got rid of a lot of the cultural features. These are both the same topo map. Um, this is the Gold Hill Mining District in New Mexico. But you can see that uh, here we've got all these mines and you know lots of uh, adits and prospects and everything. They completely took taken them off on the new maps. So so you got to look at the old maps. And but fortunately, they're all most of them are still available online. And. I used to buy hard copy topo maps all the time. Um, that got to be really expensive, but now pretty much all that you can get on, you can get almost all of them online and they're all free. All right, well, 1988, I moved to Pennsylvania, and right away I got involved in, that ex in an exploration project out here. Um, I worked for the Industrial Rocks and Minerals Group for a local consulting firm in Mechanicsburg. And what we were looking for here, my first assignment was to look for look for a new quarry site in southeastern Pennsylvania. <coughs> some of you may recognize this. This is some of these big uh, Triassic eye bases. Um, this is uh, this is part of the Reading Prong right here. Philadelphia is like just a little bit to the southeast here. And what our target though was so uh, was we were looking for these uh, looking for hornfells. These are the hard contact metamorphic rock along the contact with the Chusa diabetes, basically this, this region right here. Well, of course, uh, as you, uh, let me go back. Sorry about that. That, uh, if you know this area too, you know how developed this is too. So the, the client eventually got pretty burnt out on that. And, you know, they just want to find their own quarry. But it, the, the, uh, Thing here back in 1988, you know, we were starting to get more in, more information was becoming available, but you know, we'd always go back to first principles. You know, don't get overwhelmed with the information. Again, we looked at geologic maps, and since we were looking for a quarry, we had to find wide open parcels like farms. Now, one thing I found is that almost all these farmlands now they're all they've all got development plans on them now too, and the development plans typically don't include a quarry. Uh, but uh, you know we check potential sites in the field. And this was in the days before you could do any online online research. Uh, and as I mentioned, it was extremely difficult to locate a permanent new aggregate source in this area. And in this case, the client just gave up and they bought an existing quarry. And the one that they actually wanted to buy was compass quarries down in, or what, yeah, now it's Alan R. Myers down, down, in, uh, down along the Maryland border. All right. Well, in 1993, I started writing for Rock and Gem magazine. Um, this was, uh, you know, kind of my first uh, foray into getting into, into much more serious rock collecting. And 
I had a unique opportunity because I was splitting my time between Pennsylvania and New Mexico, but the only, really the only good resources I had were the two books. I had Mineral Collecting in Pennsylvania and Gem, Gem Trails in New Mexico. Those are both pretty, pretty old now. Um, and, but again, you know, my research was limited to only hard copy publications. Uh, again, this was in 93, and so I'd always get, you know, buying whatever books I can, you know, I could get, like at the mineral shows, or, you know, whatever I, I spent a lot of time at the Pennsylvania Geological, Library, Geological Survey Library as well. All right, well, now I'm gonna go back on, kind of change course here a little bit, but one of the things that has really changed mineral collecting and how to find new sites is all the new technology that we have to work with. And so it's, it's useful to remember some of these key milestones in technology. And one of the first one was, of course, when Netscape, back in 94, introduced their web browser. And this changed everything for mineral collecting. Of course, I never, I didn't really think of it at the time. Um, but, you know, even though, you know, it was great to finally have a, a web browser, if people weren't really posting that much stuff online at this point. So, so searching, search techniques were still in development. And so I was still mainly relying on topo maps and publications. But then, you know, back in 90, 1998, Google came, came to be, and that was, uh, you know, founded back in September 4th, 1998. Um, and, but the big thing, you know, and I think many of us would agree that not just the Google search, but Google Earth was a tremendous help in terms of being able to look look at sites because you could actually get to see in almost real time, you know, what, what sites look like. And a couple other important milestones. We had <coughs> GPS, which back in 1993, uh, or excuse me, it's actually 1983, excuse me. That was when, um, I don't know if you remember when the Korean airliner got shot down, but um, President Reagan then authorized, uh, you know, the, allow, started to allow uh, uh, the airlines and other groups to start using GPS to get, so they could better position themselves. And then there was a huge revision back in 2000 when Clinton um, made it so they got rid of that what was it uh, selective availability back when they first allowed GPS to come out they would have it off by maybe a hundred meters or so well that's like not really useful when you're trying to pinpoint something you know very well and uh, so they got rid of that and then now but there's no apparently they're, they're not gonna go back and take take that away either but that's that's why we're able to drive you know Use GPS to find find our sites, and and uh, so that's important to remember. All right. Then the other big thing was smartphones, um, and now these are commonplace. So it, 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 back in you know when these first came out, there was no way I could I could afford one, uh, and but now pretty much everyone's got one, um, and you can use these, you know, of course for you know finding where you're at on the site and actually seeing yourself in real time where you're walking at too. And I can't believe it. I, I actually didn't get my first decent smartphone until 2015. All right. Now there's also some additional online resources that I find are really really important. Uh, if I use a uh, ArcGIS.com, uh, I didn't sign up for the membership. I just use their free map uh, and. Uh, but you can get uh, LiDAR data with that. And uh, the other good one is uh, the PASTA site with, through Penn State. Uh, that's a great resource for Pennsylvania specific topography, satellite, and LiDAR data. And of course, then there's MINDAT.org. Now that's a great resource as well, but uh, you gotta be really careful because they'll often give you coordinates to localities, but often they don't, uh, a lot of those are like way, way, way off. Uh, I'm sure some of you have experienced that. What I wanted to point out with this uh, topo map here, here's kind of an older map. This is down around South Mountain in the copper copper mines there. But you can see this little uh, hill here. That's the same as this hill right here. But the LiDAR data shows there's this huge trench there. <laughs> this was a former mine 
I was real excited when I found it because you, you can actually go out in the woods and you can see this huge trench that was obviously mine. And since it was in the copper district, I figured I'd find all kinds of copper mineralization too, but uh, fortunately that wasn't the case. <laughs> um, and again, uh, you know, social media, you know, that's actually very, very useful too because there's a lot of mineral and fossil forums. Um, I know some folks like to use Facebook a lot and I see a lot of stuff on Reddit, uh, but again, you gotta really, be careful when you use that though, because a lot of the stuff is, some of it's good, but a lot of it's just total nonsense too. All right, so where do you start? Okay, well, I always just start with a basic search in Google. Like, for example, you know, you go, you know, rock collecting in Pennsylvania, you know, you get, well, this is really useful right here. Rock collecting is legal in Pennsylvania, but some state lands may prohibit it. Well, that's okay. That's not really useful information, but, you know, but at least it's a start. <clears throat> but, you know, if you're traveling, same thing, you know, like I'm going to Illinois over the holidays, you know, I, I always, you know, Google rock collecting in Illinois, and I found some really interesting sites doing that, too. Um, and again, look for sites on mindat.org. I assume, do, do most people here use Mindat quite a bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, um, and I was, I always like to Google the name of the site and, you know, get as much information to, to see if it is actually a real site. Okay. And uh, again, that last bullet was focusing on sites with public access. Now, <clears throat> one of the ways you can see if, if land's generally public, usually if it's colored, you know, like in green, that's going to tell you that it's likely public. This is up around Reading. This is actually Antietam Reservoir, and there's some interesting places up here. Um, and again, these are places that you can go to, but maybe not necessarily collect. Um, so even though it's accessible, you know, you You've got to be careful, you know, if you're going to actually decide to collect anything. Um, now, what's funny is that there's, you know, some great sites to go on, you know, like our state forest, state game, well, game lands, of course, those are, tip. there is no collecting allowed on state game lands, technically not on state forest lands either, but I see, I even see a lot of people from the survey that collect on state forest land too. Um, but uh, you know, there's also nature conservancy sites, you know, county parks, township. That almost all of them discourage collecting, but you can at least go go on the ground. Um, the big advantage of these sites, though, is that you can at least go to the site. Um, private access. Uh, generally, if you look at a topo map, this is generally going to be seen as no color. These are some of the old brownstone quarries in uh, outside of Hummelstown. This is near Hershey. These are some. Uh, the building stones that they used to make all the brownstone buildings out around uh, the Hershey and Harrisburg area. Unfortunately, now they're all owned by, I think they're partially owned by a by Rod and Gun Club and then also by the development that surrounds it. Um, and this can be, getting access to private ground can be both difficult and sometimes dangerous. And uh, my challenge is typically finding the owner and then safely, safely approaching them. And, you know, dogs and unstable people with guns. <laughs> but, uh, it, it, yeah, that, and that's no joke either. I mean, you know, this, uh, it used to be the dogs were the part, but now, unfortunately, we've got a lot more issues with people, you know, that will shoot you if you park in the driveway. That's very, very sad, but it's happened. And uh, so usually I'm just staying away from private lands, unless they're, you know, clearly in the highway right away, and if they're if they're not posted against trespassing, you know, you know, I'm usually pretty careful about that. I don't want to go into anything that is obviously some someone's land, if, whether they post it or not. But if there's a, a road cut along it, you know, that's usually going to be okay. Um, but the aggravation sometimes finding the owner is not worth it. All right. So what you want to do is you want to identify the potential area. And this was a site, actually it was at the flea market outside of Harrisburg, this was a few months back, and found this, uh, this guy was selling all this uh, green glassy slag, and I, I said, hey, where'd you get that from? He, he said it was from the Victoria Furnace, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know if anyone's ever been to that site, but it's a, it's a furnace just uh, outside of Harrisburg, former, former furnace, but it's on state game lands. Um, but I looked for the site on Google Earth, and, I was actually able to find the location, you know, look for where it, this is where it's set to park at, but this is actually a much better spot to park. Um, 
but you know, I was actually able to hike hike there, and you know, you could actually you know find the site pretty easy. Uh, again, there's no collecting there, but it still was a neat neat place to find. Uh, but uh, yeah, I he uh, but the fact that he's not supposed to collect that that certainly didn't bother the guy at the flea market. Though. So all right. Oh, oh and there's a report for that site too. Very, actually very easy to find. All right, I'm going to just show some real life examples here. Now, some of this, this one is a is an interesting site, and unfortunately, there is it's not allowed for collecting. Um, but I had heard of this many many years ago, and I'd always been trying to find it. I could never find it, and finally, yeah, I found a field guide to the site. This was by uh, John Enners with the with the survey, and. Uh, you know, I, I went through this pretty pretty closely, and the guide actually had a map in text that indicated the location of the quartz crystals, and you know, it actually had a spot down here that was numbered. And I thought, wow, you know, definitely got to got to see about, you know, just go down there and you know hike to it and find it. Well, it's a two mile hike, um, and it wasn't the kind of thing that you could just get out of the car and you know see it immediately. You had to walk two two miles, but of course this is the the first sign you see when you get out of your car, uh, there's lots and lots of these on the trail. Um, and the trail looks just like this. Um, it's really a white trail. So I, I don't know if I'm calling attention to myself by walking along this, but uh, you know, there's lots. It's all. It's almost all bikers. But here's a site. I mean, it's like right in the woods, and there's this huge cut on the road on the other side. And again, there's all these signs up here that say no collecting, but you know, you still got people digging, digging all their pits. And you know, here's a guy who left his uh, hand tools here. And uh, the uh, interesting thing about this, though, is I mentioned this at the Lancaster County Club the other day, and uh, one of the ladies that was there, she said she had gone to that site, and she it was on a rainy, it was on a rainy day. <coughs> And as soon as she got there, immediately uh, a state uh, forest guy came up and you know accused her of collecting rocks. And of course, she wasn't collecting anything. But uh, they they showed up right away. Now, when I was there, there was no one, you know, no one around at all. And I didn't see any security cameras or anything. So, uh, but that kind of concerned me though that uh, you know the state guy would actually drive all that way down, you know, just to pick on. Uh, Person, person on the hillside there. All right, and but this is what some of these quartz mm -hmm. pistons look like. They're they were pretty big, um, and this one had, had a you know it was all all muddy, uh, but they're they're up there just all lying around. But you can't can't take them. And my my smartphone we've got a program you know that shows uh, what the geology is and everything, but it only works if you've got good 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 internet access. So, but it did show the latitude and longitude. All right. But here's another one. Some of you may, I'm sure some of you have been here. Uh, this was a site I always had a lot of trouble finding. This was a mineral hill outside of media. And you know, I could find it online pretty good, but when I went to the site, it was really, really hard to find. Uh, it always was, for many years, it was private property. But then in 2012, Delaware County purchased it. And now, so now you can go on it. Um, and I didn't see any posted prohibitions on collecting, uh, but I assume it's not encouraged. But when I was going to the site one time, some guy said, "Hey, don't take all the rocks. Just leave, leave some for us." Uh, I wasn't even telling him I was rock collecting. So, but uh, <clears throat> but again, here's the, the the parking. This is where the pit was. This place was really really hard to find. Uh, I went there once. The first time I could could not find it. I actually did a second trip. And this was in April of this year. This place was just still completely overgrown. And uh, the first trip there, I found uh, an outcrop with some Amazon, Amazonite, but that, that wasn't the site. But I discussed this with one of my friends, uh, Bill Kachanoff, from the, at the Harrisburg Geological Society. And he actually gave me the coordinates. And uh, so I actually went there and then was able to, <coughs> able to find it. And so going to society and club meetings is another really good way to find places. But this is what the pit looks like. You can kind of see some of these loose rocks here, but this is some of the <coughs> typical Amazonite that's there. Now it's not really great Amazonite. That's it's really green microcline. And uh, 
here's some other pieces here too. It's all kind of that you got that light green, greenish tinge to it. So it's it's kind of neat, neat looking rock. All right, and then here's a another site that I had to find. It was uh, this was called Crystal Ridge. Now anytime I've seen a, a site with a name like Crystal Ridge, that tells me I want to go go look and see why it's called Crystal Ridge. Well, it said on Mindat, it said <clears throat> it was a well-known uh, a well-known locality for abundant quartz crystals. Well, okay, well that sounds pretty good. So let's uh, so I did some searching on that, and I had to first of all determine you know could I get access and could I park there, and so had several good clues. You know, I could actually see it on the map. Now it was private land, but you know. It, it was, well, it wasn't, it certainly wasn't marked as like a parkland or anything like that, but a lot of these areas up there, up in, this is kind of in the anthracite country, and, um, but the road was actually called Crystal Ridge Road. Um, looking on Google Earth, it looked like an open area. Um, couldn't confirm it was public, private or public, but just had to, so the only way to find out for sure was to go look. Uh, but here it is, here's the image on Google Earth. And um, I could not get a street view though. I had to actually get a street view, you know, going there myself. Uh, here's what it looks like you know, when you park there. Now there's nothing in this uh, grass here, but in this uh, kind of like that big drainage ditch, they had a lot of loose rock there. And now they had it mapped as a well in formation, which that's what the bedrock is. That all that stuff that's in the, the drainage ditch is uh, a lot of uh, Pottsville and other. You know, coal, <clears throat> some of the coal waste rock. But a lot of these had <clears throat> big uh, zones of pyrite on them. Uh, and here's a piece that had a bunch of pyrite crystals. And there was also a lot of this, uh, oh, like, I think some people call it like peacock, you know, anthracite coal. It's got that uh, kind of that iridescent look. It's, it's kind, of, kind, of, kind, of, kind of pretty looking. Uh, and this right here, this almost looked like a piece of asphalt, but these are actually pyrite crystals. This was uh, some of that, uh, you know, very, very dark sandstone. And that was just a piece of loose rock that I found, found along the road there. Okay. Then, um, what's that? Oh, okay. I'm going to go out of state. I'm going to just show a couple more sites here. Um, this is one site that I had been told was long gone. Um, this was in the Sandia Mountains in New Mexico. This is something called orbicular granite. And I was told that there was an outcrop of this stuff, but that graduate students and other people had gone up there and like either blown it up or you know completely collected all of it. And so it was supposed to be supposed to be completely obliterated. But I I always think when someone tells me that, that's usually not the case. There's always something left. Uh, so I did a lot of research, you know, finally narrowed down. The location. Now I narrowed down the location to here. Well, that's not real great as far as knowing, you know, where where to go to. But I I did find out that I had to like go up one of these uh, trails here, and using the you know some of the information from Google Earth and some of the articles that I had, I narrowed down where where off the trail I should go to. And here's the trail right here. It was a pretty steep hike up to here, and yeah, you can see it's still, still coming up here. This was in the early early afternoon. This was back in back in 2013, and uh, it was along one of these uh, hillsides right here. But I actually found uh, an outcrop with some float, and found yeah you know, one of the out, one of the outcrops that had orbicular granite. And you could actually look at you know pieces like this, and you actually saw some pieces on the ground. So you know. So it's still there. So, and this was a the an article that I wrote for Rocket Gem, you know, a couple months later too. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, there's a nice piece. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, this was in the afternoon, and this was in the, the fall. And we were still getting these big thunderstorms coming in. And right when I finally found what I was looking for, you know, I, I started to see the you know the weather change really rapidly, and you know this huge thunderstorm came in, so I got off the mountain. Fortunately, I made it back to my car without getting, getting struck by lightning. But, um, but 
but that, that's a real threat out there. So then uh, I also just wrote a, another revision to Rock County, Arizona, and I was looking for some new sites there, and this was a site I found, I, again, I found it through, through MINDAT, uh, but it's a site next to Harris Mountain, in the very, very southeastern part of Arizona. And so I looked at the topographic map and I found there were a bunch of prospects here. And, and so it looked positive, so I wanted to take a, a little look, more look at the land status around there. Now, when you're out west, you have to be aware of what the land status is. The blue land is state land. Uh, that they don't allow collecting there. In fact, you have to have a permit to even go on that land. But the, the yellow is what you want to see. That's the Bureau of Land Management land. And the white is private. That's private ranch land. But it's usually posted pretty well, too. So, But this was that little area that had all the prospects on it. And so we uh, wound up going there on the BLM land. And this is uh, one of the things that you see quite a bit in Arizona, too. These are some of these uh, abandoned, uh, you know, the mine shafts with the signs, you know, saying stay out. Um, these things actually are quite dangerous, because if you're, you definitely don't want to be walking around here with your cell phone, you know, because you, these, uh, if you fall into these, you're, 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 you're that's it. Uh, and that also goes, like, if you've got a dog or something like that, you got to be really careful with that, too. And this was that little knob just uh, north the Harris Mountain. You can kind of see some some of the little lines on it. Yeah, there's some mine dumps right here. And here's a, another closer view of them. And this was uh, when we were hiking over there. It's pretty pretty easy hiking, uh, but it's still, it, the main thing is you just gotta watch out for the cacti and you know, the yucca and everything else. And this, Here's some of the mine dumps here down the bottom of the photo. But uh, the mines there were pretty pretty interesting. They were mainly copper lead mines. There were, here's some galena, here's some malachite. Here's some of the galena and malachite in, in, a, in a hand sample. And we also had some azure right there too, which was kind of nice. And here's another piece with some, a lot of malachite and a little bit of lead azure too. All right, now, this was a site um, and this was the, the last site I'm talking about here. Um, this was a site I just found the other day, um, and I was uh, was going to go on that trip to the Beltsville um, fossil collecting site. This was uh, back on November 4th, and unfortunately, the person who was going to run it, got, they, uh, them and their son got COVID, so they had to cancel it. So uh, basically, it, you know, it was all set to leave on a collecting trip and then couldn't go. So I said, okay, well, I'm gonna find another place. And uh, so I looked around and I came across this uh, place called Coppermine Creek Preserve. It was on map part of it. It wasn't on Google Google Maps or anything. And I thought, well, that, yeah, that's kind of strange. What is that? And, but further checking, you know, didn't, it didn't look like it wasn't gonna be anything that you could actually get access to. So, but. When I was looking at that, though, I found this other nearby site. It was called uh, White's Mill Preservation Area. Okay, well, that's told me that that's at least maybe an area that you can, you can go to. And when you looked at it on uh, on Google Earth, you could actually see it's like a lake, and it's got a big dam here with a lot of a lot of rocks on it, and it's also got a, a public parking area too. And so that was that was encouraging. And since knowing what the geology of this was, you know, they're, they're always going to use local rocks for the dam. So I figured it might be, you know, some dye base with uh, might have some zeolites in it. So I thought it was at least worth checking out. And, and nice to see that it had that parking area too. Um, and there, there were a lot of online reviews, not for rock collecting, but you know, just people going there and said it was said it was accessible. And. I looked on Google Street View, and you could actually see that it had a gate. Now, you can't really read this, but the gate says it's, uh, I think it was Salford Township open space, not a no trespassing sign. So I thought, okay, well, that's that's good. Cool. There's like a little kiosk there that's kind of like a guide at the site, too, so that was good. So I actually went there, and uh, it was a dam 
you know, area, just like it showed on the map. And yeah, a lot of loose rocks, a combination of dye base and cornfells. And most were unmineralized, but, and there was also a fisherman there at the lake too, but he really showed no interest at all in what I, what I was doing. But uh, I didn't want to, you know, bang on rocks too much, and, you know, because I didn't want to make him think I was going to scare his fish. Um, but uh, he later suggested some other areas to go look for rocks too. Um, but this, uh, you know, I found some, uh, you know, pyrite and calcite on some of the dye base there. And here was a big slab with a bunch of calcite crystals. And you couldn't really break this apart, though. That was, that was unfortunate. So that's still there. But I found these, I uh, think I did find, I, I thought it was very interesting, though. So a lot of the, some of the horn fells, um, some of the fractured pieces, they had some veins that uh, apparently were, were still white. And could see it that, that well here, but these are all radiating glades of still white, and uh, you know it's like you know, about this fist size piece, and you know it's kind of a kind of an interesting piece. So, but anyway, found that that was in the Hornfells, and didn't see it in the dye bases. So, but anyway, I thought that was a uh, definitely a, a neat sight to see. Uh, if I'm ever in the area again, I probably will we'll check that out again. So, anyway, so in conclusion, then you know we're yeah, our hobby is really greatly enhanced by, by modern technology, but you need to know how to use it. And and while none of this was available before the 90s, now it's commonplace. Again, you know, this gets back to you know assuming that everyone knows you know all all about this technology and how to use it, but um, but it's certainly much much easier now than it was before. And uh, but again, it's easy to take all that tech today for granted too. So you can apply these these techniques to wherever you go in, in both the U.S. and international. So, and just remember, there's still plenty of sites to find and, and visit, but unfortunately, not all out collecting. So you, you have to keep that in mind too. So, anyway, that's um, that's the end of the end of the talk. <laughs>